had a feeling that was the case. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining me today. My name is Aaron Shea, and welcome to this next edition of Habitat Now. And I am honored today to have artist John and Kate, John Littleton and Kate Lowell joining us from their home studio, North Carolina. Uh, those of you who came to our show here in Detroit for our anniversary had the honor of seeing them in person. And since then, they have become even more busy doing installations at Muskegon and have a full uh, retrospective at, 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 in Wisconsin. So they'll talk more about that as, as we get through this. But thank you for joining me today. It's great to have you both uh, here today. And uh, let's zip through some of the homes housekeeping. Again, we saw this media this stuff on Facebook, inviting people to come to today's talk. Our Glass Coast weekend is in process for end of January. We have idea for show. We're trying to find a new location. So pencil us in to make sure you're part of our event down there at the Glass Coast. The 50th exhibition is still on display. If you haven't seen it yet, you're obviously invited. John and Kate's work is included in the show. They have a great presentation uh, with, with lots of uh, things to see. Uh, John Miller has an exhibition. These artists are in our Habitat family. John's at the Flint Institute of Arts. Uh, Latches of Boyajev and Steve Lynn have exhibitions at the Fort Wayne Museum of Art in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Exhibitions you have to go see. And also check it out online. They did an amazing tour of Steve Lynn's exhibition virtually that was well done. Uh, kudos to you, Charles. Well, I'd like to welcome John and Kate. I found this picture on my computer. I have lots of photos, which is quite amazing. This is us a couple of years ago uh, at one of the SOFA shows, um, and we're grateful to have you today. So uh, say hello, and we'll get into your slides. All right. All right. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everybody, for coming and joining us today. It was really, it's awesome to see everybody's little icons as they sign in. That's great to see everybody's faces, and soon again, yes. we'll be more face-to-face -face as time goes by. Yep. Oh, so, um, you sent me a couple of images of the museum. I'm going to put them up right now. We can talk about that. Okay. okay. This um, is a, a great, a great image of the building. Yeah. This is from the lakeside, the Bergstrom Mahler, and uh, it was a collection started by Mrs. Mahler. And no, Mrs. Bergstrom. Mrs. Bergstrom. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. And, and um, she started collecting paperweights and became really passionate about it. So she and her husband actually donated, this was their home. They donated it to the city of Muskegon, or Muskegon, the city of Nina, Wisconsin. And the museum houses a very large paperweight collection as well as contemporary glass. Um, if you go to the next picture, this is just the other side of it. This it's, is the entrance from the street side. Yeah, it's an absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous setting that this museum is in. It looks really quite, spectacular. It looks quite beautiful. It looks like a castle in a way. And I love the uh, yes. post poster up yes. front. Yes. Yeah. Nina, no Nina's a wealthy city on the lake there. And it's, um, I think, surrounded by water. It's paper companies. I mean, what it's really, it's history and founding. And, um, it's just, I mean, it was so beautiful. There's so much water. I mean, we, we've fallen in love with it as a little town that's pretty, pretty nice place. And one of the things that, one of the things we want to talk about is also as an artist, what it's like to sort of step inside the other side of being in the arts, where it's like what it takes for a museum to put together a show like this. So one of the really sweet spots for us was, and we should probably, oh, do we need to share our screen? Oh, for this, okay. I, Wait, did, no, no, Aaron still has it, okay. Go to the next slide, Aaron. Sure. Next, next slide's gonna be the uh, video. No, they're, no. Oh, okay, so wait a second. So we do need to I share our screen one. quick, okay. stop so it. Let me, let me stop and go back on my screen real quick and I'll stop sharing. Feel free to share your screen. Okay. okay. There. I thought I had put those in beforehand. Maybe I did. Okay, so right down to here. Okay, so and go. Uh, you have to go to. I have to be able to get this where I can see it. We can see okay. your PowerPoint right now. Yeah, but I want to get it so that I can. Here we go. View. View. Okay. What do you? Oh, I. Oh. From. No, you don't want it from the. Go, well, go to the very. Go to the. Go to the very bottom of the screen. The there it bit. is. There we go. There we go. Right. Now you should have it. Okay, right. sorry. No worries. So, so one of the fun things of um, putting together a show is they uh, wanted to do, we wanted to do some short videos that might be interspersed with the show itself. And they sent a crew down and they did for three days filming us. 
Hmm. And so it's getting to know the staff. Here's the last night when everybody was filming on our back deck. So Brian, the videographer, had a drone. So he sent up the drone <laughs> to take a picture of all of us. So I think it's it was being involved with the process of putting together a show like this gave us sort of an inside view of one, what a massive undertaking putting together a show for a museum is, both from pulling together documentation and like thinking about how does the show lay out, what engages the public, and the video was part of it, but also for us the sweet spot was getting to know all the staff and different people who work on the project. Okay, so we can stop our share, and I think that Aaron is going to share um, a short clip from the, uh, the, video. the video. This, you know, what, Aaron, that does not look like that's the beginning. That's like I know it's gonna it's gonna kick out anyway. Okay. It just does okay. whatever it wants. So I think my sound okay. is on, so we should be able to watch this. We were excited about the drone footage, being able to see our property from the <laughs> air like this. Contact in glass. During a month of cold work in March, my parents mix the cool blue alginate, the drill humming as it stirs the mixture that will set like jello. In the impressions, grandmother's face is old and wrinkled, her hands knobby from arthritis and years of farm work, raising sheep, chickens, and horses. 21 sleek Hungarians fill most of her time with vet visits, stitches, baling hay, and mucking stalls. These hands welcome my brother's smooth young face as they did when he was born. In plaster positives taken from alginate molds, my parents bond her hands to his face and then to graphite to be cast in glass. At 2,050 degrees, my parents lift bright yellow hot glass out of the furnace poured into the graphite mold, filling the void between grandmother and my brother. So that's just the beginning of the video. And um, if you want to see the whole thing, it's 22 minutes long. You can find it on YouTube if you search Berkster Mahler between us, or you can even go to the Berkster Mahler Museum site and they'll get it. And then um, I think Aaron has the trailer that he's gonna show next um, from the video that they created. Oh, did we lose you, Aaron? <laughs> Hopefully not. I said we we're two minutes and 33 seconds in on that movie, and it's shockingly impressive so far. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to watching the rest. And I'll share the link for the movie at the end of the Zoom so people can find it easily. Okay. But we'll play the trailer right now so I can get it going. What's between us, I think, is an incredible amount of trust and compassion. I guess when I think about our lives together, they're so intertwined that it's hard for me most of the time to imagine us not being together. The work that we produce is something that neither one of us would make. We've been working together long enough and we've developed a, a way of working that both of us have input in the piece. It's not what Kate would make, it's not what I would make, mm -hmm. but it's something that's formed between us and is a product of our collaboration. Mm -hmm. 
Very okay. well done. All right, let's see what I got. Next slide. Stop my presentation. That's what I keep notice of. Okay, right. now it's time for our share our, our screen, screen again. Like take over. Yep. Um, we got to go down past that. Slideshow. Um, current slide. Yeah. Got to go down two more. One. Okay. All right. And, and is that you may get full screen? Yeah. Um, it's under. Nope. You have to go to view. Hmm. Don't you? Maybe not. Um, There's a shortcut on the bottom of the screen. If you click that little, looks like a projector screen down, down, right, right, right. It looks on the like far right. Yep. Yeah, if you click a little screen button, go left, 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 left John, right there here. You go, right there. there. Yep. Click that. That will kick you right. In there stage. we go. Okay. So okay. now, you know, you just got to click through two more times. One, two, three. Did it get it yet? No, nope. we're still in the dark. We're still in the dark. This is a good slide. <laughs> There you go. Um, it? It's not coming through. I wonder if it stalled out on what was the other one. Um, you can press escape and try to try it again. Yeah, I think we have to. Sorry. Or, or the technicalities it's, of it. Um, let's try one more time. And didn't like that. So this time, get it there. OK, so you're there. So now you should be able to come down here and go click. It's, uh, you know what it is, it was wanting to play the video again. So you have to double click to get out of there. Now you have to click, double click there. There we go. Now we're right. finally All right, we are good. All right. <laughs> so It's always like a choose so, your own adventure. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> Sometimes it's not as intuitive as you think. Yeah. So one of the things that I think that people don't always realize is how many people are behind making a show happen. So um, the couple on the left, many of you probably know, John and Sharon, they were our patron angels in this project. They showed up about three or four years ago saying, we think you guys are old enough for a retrospective. We've and of course we said, no, we're not. <laughs> And then John and Sharon said, well, you probably are. And went, oh, yeah, you're right. We are. But they also just like got behind it and said, we'd like to help make this happen. So they were one of the major sponsors for the show and made it possible for the museum to do the video and a catalog and just really make it a special experience. And then to also all the museum staff from the curators like Casey Eckhorn and Amy Moorfield, who's the director, and John, who's the assistant director, and then not showing are um, Jim um, Weeder and Brian, and I'm blanking his name or last name right now, who is He's the videographer. The videographer. But, but we'd started arranging the show with Jan Smith um, before he yep. came on as director. Yep. So it goes back quite a ways. And it's also, those are our, our three children in the okay. picture between John and I as well. Try, maybe you're trying to click with too many options. There, try it there. Okay. Here's one of the pictures from the opening. Mm -hmm. so the um, show installed is, is installed in two rooms and dad is also showing in another room. So the yeah. show takes up three rooms. A great space. Yeah. This is one of dad's first pieces in glass. It's actually his second um, that was cast in Vicor glass in 1946. And there are 15 of his pieces um, in uh, the display. show. And they go from that really early piece to some of the last series he did, which was the implied movement. And one of the things that we really love about this museum space is that because it was a home, there's a lot of spaces that feel very much like it would be like walking into someone's house where you have this beautiful outer exterior light coming in. So then now we jump back to the main show of John and I. So this is actually some of the work that I was making when I was in college. Um, I took both, I started out in printmaking and drawing. And then my last two years, I shifted to glass and metal and so I was combining the two of them. This is copper and blown glass. 
this one as well is it's copper that I was slumping in between the glass. And with both of these pieces, um, I really was very interested in working with the two materials and combined. And it's sort of funny because we kind of set that aside for a number of years and then came back around to it. And I think it's one of the things that John and I have found over the years is that sometimes we'll pick up something that came from um, a passion that one or the other of us had, and then we circle back around to it and start using it in another way in our work. And at the university, I started mainly in photography. I took the glass classes. I liked the, the students and the, the energy of the glass. Um, this is actually Chris Reese. And I took the glass classes independent study and started adding photos onto glass and slumping the glass plates so that there was some relief on the, on the surface there. Kate and I started working together in my father's studio. We worked there about a year. And the first pieces were um, just working with the materials, freezing some of that fluid form when it's hot. And then we started working with painted fiberglass and liked the design work so much that we were starting these layered pieces of um, gathered glass, the triangular forms. This is one of the first that we cut and polished. And making those triangular forms really allowed us to maintain that the, the fabric, whereas when we were blowing it in blown pieces, it really blew, blew out and stretched out and changed. So 42 years of collaboration, we're not gonna be able to show you every series we went into, but <laughs> some of the ones that influenced us later um, were the fluoropods and these were the mid eighties. And it's just kind of interesting because this is a piece we showed at Habitat during that same time frame. And then this is another piece that was from that flower series. And this one is very small compared to most of the flowers that we were doing. And it was influenced by small scale detail, which was a show that Ferd put together in the 80s. We got into the White House collection and um... CBS sent a, a film crew to photograph us making a piece for, uh, I think they were doing their morning show. Yeah, CBS Sunday morning, yep. And this was the piece that we made during that. And one of the things that's really wonderful about an experience like that is as a young artist that year, we had so much exposure. Um, they did, I think we were in, the White House collection got us exposure in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Christian Science Monitor, we were on CBS Sunday morning. And that launched us in a ways that nothing else could have. They put the show in a book and traveled it to the Smithsonian. So it's now at the Clinton Library, I yeah. believe. But it was, it was great exposure for yeah. us. And those bags at that point were coming along far enough. We'd been working in that series long enough that we started thinking about the bags as relationships, as in human relationships, and the way if someone leans into someone or is climbing on someone, what does that feel like? We have three children, so um, we oftentimes had either one in our arms or one leaning us going, Mom, are you ready yet? <laughs> so we were thinking all these human ideas with the bags, and we thought, well, maybe it's time to do some literal um, work with human qualities to it. And we really learned on these crystal pieces. We started doing life casting with those. So they're direct cast off of a person. And we were also very interested in that idea. Many of you probably know we did bags inside of a bag. So it's a container. And in these pieces, all of these hands are actually holding quartz crystals. And they're inside of a quartz crystal like form. And quartz was one of the materials that glass emulated. It was a very expensive material that was used mostly in the royal courts when they did cutting of like vessels for ceremonies or just to honor someone. And so it was also that play on that historical part. The development of clear glass was emulating quartz crystal. So some of these pieces we would pour cast and this is an image of us picking up a pot out of our furnace to put in a cradle to pour. 
you can we could pour about 100 maybe 120 pounds of glass at a time at a time and with these pieces we were really looking much more at it being a contained space where you were looking inward both at yourself or at someone else and also at inward relationships so three generations was created for a show at art in the embassies um, for Bosnia. Uh, Bosnia and Segovia. They were doing a exhibition that was about generations. It's Kate's hand, our daughter's hand and Kate's father's hand. And this one is to no avail. Um, there's a lot, <laughs> a lot behind this piece. It, um, Kate's sister kind of sparked it in that she came to visit one time and she was talking about all these adults wanting her to do this or that and how she felt like they were forming her um, without her permission in a way. And the veil has so many cultural significant um, as to whether a bride might wear it or whether it's a part of the culture that it can be an honoring, it can be an obscuring. And so for us, it was just looking at what does a veil mean? And also sometimes a veil can be something we put on ourselves to try and hide who we are sort of behind that public mask we put out there. So I think as Casey also was uh, the curator of the show was putting it together, he tried to pick out groups of pieces that would talk about some of the themes that ran through our work. So those three cast blocks were some of the things that he was looking at that, that really covered one sort of focus that we had during a time period when we were working. And this piece is more about reaching out um, and touching in between the, the bowl form is more like a sky or a sun and the, the bottom form is electroplated copper, but it's like the rooting and the into getting into the earth and our hands are the, the bridge in between. And I think this is one of the pieces that sort of the transitional, we were starting to think about moving away some from just doing the cast blocks and working with the hands more. We viewed the hands as a way to connect with the world it was our first point of contact with another human being mm -hmm. or objects in our environment. This one's back to the um, idea of a young person holding an old sage inside, that old wisdom that they might hold. And there's a companion piece to this that's an older person with a um, young, child's. young child's face inside. And this piece, it's the hands are holding a form that we were thinking of um, a potential, an energy, possibility that design inside of the glass disc could be um, a galaxy or it could be an egg. Or, or it could be an idea. An idea. Yeah. And I think you'll see that that shows up throughout our work. And so I think one of the reasons that Casey picked this is that it is a transitional, a, a piece that really shows a connection through a number of different pieces. It's beautiful. beautiful. Thank you. This one is um, kind of that traveling through time generations, um, giving you a sense of our perception of how things move on in time. I mean, with some of the pieces, we were also just playing with different cut forms and how the hand can hold it up and display that piece relationship like a, a chrysalis or a cocoon. Also working with the reflection, reflection the refraction, the optics of the glass mm -hmm. and trying to get the light to come through the hands to give them extra life. The place that we live has really also been a really big influence on our work. So it seems inevitable that it keeps creeping back in. So these are actual castings of leaves that we use to put in this hand. And these of course were a huge in influence on our work, our children. And in, with this piece here, it's our three children's hands, um, Annalisa, Eric, and John Paul. 
And we were really exploring what binds families and communities together, what bonds um, both support us and which bonds restrict us over time. And with all of these, even though most of our subject matter is family and friends, we really view them as being universal. It could be someone else's children or it could be someone else's friends. It's not, it's not about just our family, but it's about the humanity. And I think that's one of the reasons we love hands is that they really speak to us as humans. Um, some of them are really, our hands are really weathered and wrinkled and old. Some of them are really soft and you can see like there's almost like no pattern in a really young child's hands. And here's the piece um, in the Bergstrom Muller Museum of Glass. As we said, it's just, it's a spectacular setting where the lake is back behind everything. So Kate and I did a series, um, What's Between Us, uh, a, a bit about our collaboration, kind of self-portraits and uh, most of the time we can plug together and, and come together on an idea and get it to work really well. But we did a whole series of these, what's between the two, the two of us. Mm -hmm. Or in pieces like this fishing, it was discussions that John and I were having about young people as our kids were looking at finding someone else, a significant other in their life, trying to find that match that connection. So here we're back to the flowers again, and these are cast instead of hot worked flowers. Uh, we worked out how to cast the succulent form, the leaves, and the flowers themselves are a single casting, uh, carefully loaded to be able to get the color um, to change mm -hmm. the color variations. And the piece up on the left is actually one that Habitat has from that series. And the one down below is what's at Bergstrom Mahler. And with these, we were really, we just would come in and sort of create like flowers from our mind. It wasn't like it was copying something that was out there. It was just looking at how the, the leaves would feel, the gesture, the movement, the colors. And this is from the entrance to the show in, at Bergstrom. It's the part of the Ikebana series. So with those um, pieces, it's sort of interesting because people go, oh, were they started by the other flowers? And I don't think it was something we consciously thought about it. It was more about that we'd been doing flowers and hands like these. And we were thinking about needing to scale something up for a space that we were asked to um, do a potential commission for. And we're like going, well, what could we do? And that was when we thought about combining the glass and the metal. But one of the things that's really wonderful about a retrospective is it gives you a chance to step back and look at your own work. And I think sometimes we're so close to what we do that we don't see the threads that run through things or the connections. And I hadn't really thought about, because we hadn't really had a lot of the older flowers out in our studio. And it was like, oh, I guess we had harkened back to it. But at that point we were casting, we weren't just hot working. And so how it changes both how you approach it and maybe the ideas that are behind the pieces as you mature. The retrospective also allowed us to um, see other people's um, perception of our, our collaboration. Susie Silbert wrote a great um, essay. essay for the, the catalog, as well as Casey, the curator. Yep. And Amy also wrote something for it as well, the, the director of the museum. So hearkening back to nature, we did a whole series of pieces that we built out of wax and then cast that were based on the spiral. And with this one, we actually chose not to put it in a set of hands, but just to have it a free standalone. It's a, a bigger scale as well. Yeah. And one of the things that became really interesting to us was we had been thinking about how the glass flowed in the flowers, but in a piece of this scale, we could really play with how the glass would flow into the mold and how it would actually imprint on the finished piece and that it would actually echo the movement of water.
Here's another one with spiral. It's a, a, a couple that makes glass holding the, the spiral heart. So it's their relation and the, the kind of growth that feeling that you get from a spiral. And our community and our family plays a big role also because they're often models for all of our pieces. <laughs> and we're, we're like out looking and going, oh, Amber has really long fingers and so does <laughs> Mike's. I think they would look really beautiful on this piece. What do you think? <laughs> it's funny. So this is another time, and it started with just the hands and the, the round clock face with the, the spring on it. So the hands are holding clock gears. Uh, we got a mantle clock, and the mainspring was broken, so we, um, we could get the gears out of it. It was hard to find gears at that time because of steampunk. <laughs> And we were also caring for dad who had some memory problems and thinking about time. How could we put time in a piece? How, can, how could the hands hold on to a, a time? So this piece, we actually worked on this piece for over four years. It, it kept getting bigger as we kept thinking about other things we want to add to it. We were going, oh, it needs to be larger. It needs to be larger. Um, and we were, as we were talking about time, we were talking about sound. So this piece actually has a motion sensor in it. As you approach it, the sound of the ticking clock comes on. Um, it's, it's analog clocks, and that kind of time is disappearing towards digital time. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, we also, as we picked out photos, so these are all pre-1950s black and whites of different people. Um, you can go to the next one, John. Um, they're family friends, family. We just called up people and said, hey, can you send us some of your favorite photos from your family, black and whites? And what was really cool is each one of them came with a story. And yet at the same time, we know that 50 years from now, no one will know those stories. Those stories will be gone just like those people are gone. And yet there'll still be this shadow that's cast. We really love the way that- So you can see the shadow of the little girls in their dress behind. Mm -hmm. So a shadow of themselves behind. So Harvey's dementia was making us so he wasn't aware of time. And we feel like that that's something that, you know, whether we'd like it or not, time is something that's always shifting. And so part of what we were trying to capture was how fleeting time was. And also just that whole sense that it's not gonna be the same in a hundred years. A child won't look at this clock and know how to tell time, just like they won't know who any of those people are, that it will be fleeting and moving on. Hmm. This piece is discovery. Um, with, with, as we've worked with the cutting over the years, we really love how it plays with the light and changes what you see that's within the cut form and how it will multiply the image and capture the light and shred it, send it around a room that it's in. It gives that element inside the potential to multiply. Yeah, and we like that the hands are elevating it. We've now, a couple of them actually are called My Gem, which is a play on the fact that it's often our daughter's or our son's hands that we're holding the gems. And what is the thing that's precious is it that child or is it this semi-precious object? So we live in a, a beautiful place and we often go for walks to recharge. The light is amazing, the layering of the mountains. That's our son John Paul in the image along with Kate. And I think that that light has influenced our work over time as well. It makes us look at how we can capture that feeling of light in pieces and the layering. <laughs> this is another one of the pieces that's at, well, most of these are Berkster Miller, but this piece, I think that one of the reasons Casey chose it is because it's a transitional piece. You see both some of the things that we were doing with the boats but it directly echoes what we started doing with the next series of pieces. So this is a little model for um, the luminous intergalactic stellar spheres. Great title. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and here's the actual piece. This was actually at Habitats International, is it two years ago now? Or three years yeah. ago. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'd um, say probably three and two. Yeah, and it's about 12 feet wide, about comes to about three and a half feet off the ceiling down. It has a motion sensor and it triggers a program when you walk in, in close to the piece. Mm -hmm. And it, what's been fun with these new newer series of pieces, people go, well, how in the world did you get there? Where does that relate to you know, your other work? But if you look at these pieces, we have that central element, that energy that's contained in each one of these spheres, which was the same thing that was held in the hands. And it actually was in some of the early clip cast blocks that we were doing. The light is in the, the metal ring around the outside edge, but there's a glass plate that carries the light into the hemispheres. It's almost like fiber optics. It makes each hemisphere look like it's individually lit. And yeah. I think as we worked on these, the first one we made in this series did not have light in it. And we finished and we went, oh, this piece needs light. But we decided we didn't want the light outside, but we wanted it to feel like the light was coming from within. And these pieces look like they need motion. So, um, this might be a little jerky, but it's taking that same idea with uh, little windows into the middle and adding motion to the piece. And as you look in and some of the holes will line up, you can see all the way into the center, or sometimes you only see a short distance in. Mm. And we really love the way it changes your view and the optics of the piece as you go. And this is the catalog from our show. It's 81 pages, which was fabulous. That was also an interesting project to be involved with. Um, Jim Weeder, who's the um, person who really organized the majority of the catalog, was just really fabulous working to hear his thought process about how he visualized putting together the catalog, the um, graphics for it. So the cover of the catalog the background is actually the poem that our daughter is reading in the beginning and the end of the video that they created talking about our glass. Mm -hmm. um, and he used that as a method to sort of like tie both the video together and the visuals for the catalog, which I thought was like a really creative um, way of doing it. And I think that's one of, the, one of the things that was really fun working with the museum people is also seeing creativity in another area and how they, they use that to make things come to life. So just after the opening, we did a workshop on casting hands. You can see on the right, a, a wax hand in the mold, and on the left, pouring the investment material around that hand. The AECG uh, gave a grant that helped sponsor this workshop. Yep. It was really so, fun to see what everybody decided to do. One person who does writing had a pencil that was being held by the hand. Um, each person had a different idea of what they wanted it to be. It was pretty cool. So when Habitat's 50th anniversary was being planned and Aaron was talking about it, we were like, oh, why don't we just do a piece from each decade to share with Habitat? So here you have one of our really early pieces from the 80s, a handkerchief in favor with that fiberglass that we talked about. Then we put one of the cast blocks in it. Agreement. One of the hands and gems pieces. It's a close up of it. A what's between us piece. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Those are bound hearts. The hearts fit together. And a gimbal. And let's see if this will play. It might be a little jerky for all of you, but we love the way the gimbals move. They're almost an unpredictable uh, motion to them. They can reverse directions. They can speed up and slow down in their rotation. One said it's son who um, is works at SpaceX said, oh, it's like chaos theory. I love it. <laughs> So this is the second part of our talk. And it's the second part. So the two big things this year were our um, retrospective. retrospective. And then we did the largest public art installation that we've done to date. 
and it's in Muskegon, Michigan. And so we learned all sorts of things about um, submitting to um, public art space. Then when we saw this roundabout, we said, we're gonna make this happen no matter what. <laughs> and we taught ourselves Fusion 360 enough to make the model. It's a CAD program. And so we first submitted over two years ago in July. And as we started working on it, we were also thinking about as you're making a submission for a public art piece, what, what is gonna make this significant or the connection to that city? So as we thought and learned more about the city of Muskegon, we looked at the natural beauty that surrounds it. You have the beautiful green, green in the summer, you have the water, the sky. And so as we chose the colors for the pieces, we picked out those colors in relationship to the landscape. So we made some molds and had Kokomo glass cast it for us. They keep a, um, I think it's around 30 different colors that they're willing to cast in, in a doll's glass kind of form for you. We made the molds and got them to cast it for us. So when the glass arrived, it's 154 pieces that make up the sculpture. I think they sent us probably 225 pieces. Because we had to do a lot of sorting and fitting because not all of the glass is cast exactly the same thickness. It's close, but there's a fair amount of variation. So with some of the pieces, we might have edited the ones that were a little too thick or a little too thin, or maybe there was a, a slight color shift or something about it wasn't right, but it gave us enough to make it. Uh, putting together the steel for it, we picked the most durable steel we could find, which was uh, 304 and 316 stainless. And the piece is going to be outside, so it needs to stand up to salt and near, in the traffic circle, as well as rain and wind. And yeah, they, they told us when, when we were first asked if we would submit something for there, they, I was asking Judy who, Hainer, who is the project manager, I was like, well, like what kind of winds are we looking at? And she goes, oh, 65 miles an hour is not unusual at all. <laughs> like, okay. So the first thing we did was get some engineering. <laughs> we were like, I'll, I'll let you know if we can do this after we talk to the engineer. <laughs> so you can see the open channel above the glass which is where the LEDs go. And we made that so they are replaceable. Um, before we actually put the piece together the first time, we put one, um, of the ring sets with the glass in it to make sure there wouldn't and the be wiring. and yeah. the wiring to make sure there wouldn't be any problems with that aspect of it. Yeah. So this was our crew for the first erection of the piece. Um, and our guy, the, the gentleman on the, the, I guess it's on the right, is um, was our main fabricator. He was fabulous. We would take him drawings. We did some of the fabrication in our studio, but the majority of it Justin Turcoat did. And um, it's so wonderful when you work with another craftsman who's got the level of skills that he does. So from here, we took it all apart again and put in the rest of the glass. Uh, when you start gluing this, oh, okay. Um, you have to keep going. It's a silicone and if it sets too much- um, You can't tool you, it or you can't clean tool it, up. it. So, it takes about four hours to go all the way around this and, and we just had to keep going. <laughs> so one person is putting in the glue and tooling it and the other person is pulling off the tape behind them and making sure everything is cleaned up and ready to go. Mm. Uh, okay. There. Um, this piece weighed about 385 pounds. Yeah, maybe 390, yeah. So it was beyond the, the weight that Kate and I could and handle by ourselves. <laughs> Incredible. So here is all of the, well not all, this is five of the seven rings completed in the studio. We've ended up putting pretty much everything on wheels by this point because we had so little space to work in that we would have to like move everything to one side of the room to work on whatever component we were working on at the time. Okay, so we need to keep going. Quickly. So this is the install in Muskegon, very fast. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just try and zip through the rest because it's getting yeah. towards the end of our time here. Yeah. Question from the audience about the metal work. Did you do all the metal work in your studio? Was that gentleman you were pointing at earlier did in his studio? Uh, Justin, Justin did most of the metal work. 
Uh, we did the first ring set in our studio. And uh, just to work out all the problems with it, and make oh. sure we didn't have any concerns about what was happening. And then we would take the rest of it to him afterwards. Gotcha. John did a couple of like spot well, like things when we were like bringing it back and you're like, going, oh, that's not quite right. But because of the CAD program, we could give Justin all the angles, all everything um, would be set beforehand. Yep. And our, we could, he was unable to come with us to Michigan. Michigan was a hot spot at that time. And he wasn't vaccinated. So our son who works at SpaceX was like, I think I could take some time off. So he actually flew out and helped us with the install. Michigan- This was the third day. We Michigan got... gave us a little bit of everything and weather just to make sure <laughs> that we were like, knew where we were. Okay, well, <laughs> welcome to the club, welcome to the party. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But we Snow, also got sleep, these... everything. Yep. We got these wonderful views. This is from the top. <laughs> the piece is 22 and a half feet high. And as we put it up, we could see it reacting with the landscape and the, the sun, the light. It was amazing to see it. How it different framed it. And I think it's really exciting because you can see a piece on small scale. And you might have aspirations for what it's going to be like when it's done. But to actually finally put it together and see it is a totally different thing. Kate's family came and joined us. They cooked for us, made sure we got something to eat because we basically worked from sunrise to sunset. Yeah. <laughs> I think there was a couple nights when we were out there where it was starting to get dark. And also Muskegon gave us a couple of people who volunteered and helped and they were fabulous. Judy Wiener was the project coordinator and she just made everything happen. Yeah, that's great. What kind of so foundation? What kind of foundation support did you have to have in place for this? Um, so it, it actually it's a big cast concrete slab, but underneath each one of the places where the legs come down, mm -hmm. it's actually cast thicker than that. And then it, we used a Hilti system for anchoring it into the um, slab, okay. which is pretty uh, standard pretty standard industry. Yeah, it's amazing stuff. Mm -hmm. So when we were creating this piece, one of the things we were also thinking besides the color reflecting the landscape was also that Muskegon was built on a steel structure and that it was a big part of the community. We wanted those steel legs to reflect that. And we were also looking at that the rings reflected the circles of people that were coming together to create a stronger, bigger structure than they would individually. We also wanted the rings to glow up. As you're coming from town, the rings are above Lake Michigan, and we didn't want the base of it to really interfere with your view of the lake and have the, the rings almost like a constellation above them. This is yeah, just... And they light up by themselves? Is that what I just saw? It's dusk to dawn lighting, so it, it starts to light up at night. This is where it's about to shut off in the morning. As you drive around the piece, you have different views. So in some places, the legs are very much intertwined and the rings make almost like a circle. And other times it spreads out like a long line. And there's no extra lighting on the legs. They're just reflective and pick up any light in the area. Here's some close-ups of some of the piece. This was early morning. So there's a bit of um, dew, dew mm -hmm. on, the, on the rings. Just the close-up of the detail, the construction of the piece. And here you can see the, the glass was cast um, on graphite that had patterning in it. We wanted the patterning to look like the trails that a star might make when it runs across the sky. Here's early morning and here's sunset. This last one. Yep, and this is just one of the framings. And I think that was one of the things that was fun to see is how the different rings would frame things in the sky at night or in the day as well. So, so that is, that's a little bit of time for questions. Time for a few questions? Yep, yeah. that's, that's all of our slides. We can stop or share. Or if they want to go back to yeah. the slide. And thank you, Aaron, for having us. Um, give a chance to share both our retrospective and um, our Muskegon project. It's been a really full year for us. And 
I think one of the really sweet spots has been able to finally share our work with other people after months and months of feeling cooped up with the pandemic. Um, it made you really appreciate how important a part as an artist it is to be able to connect with other people and share your creative process. Oh, that's great, guys. What an impressive year you guys had. I can't wait till 2022. I'm sure you're going to do twice as much. <laughs> uh, I don't Amazing. know if I want to do twice as much. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe if we get some extra help. <laughs> well, everybody been, has been commenting how impressed they are with the work and how uh, wonderful it is that they're able to be here today and experience the work. We had a question about your children um, from Anthony about their exposure to art. Have any of them dabbled in uh, the arts themselves or I know you said your son works, one of your sons work at, works at SpaceX. I figured you would answer that question. Um, both, for them. both of our sons work at SpaceX. One's in propulsion, the other's in the um, Satellite. satellites, the ground system for mm -hmm. their internets. And mm -hmm. um, our daughter is a, a writer. The poem that starts our video and ends our video that um, Bergster Mahler produced is, is her poem. And our, both of our sons dabble in the arts. So our one son loves woodworking and the other son has done a little bit of everything from ceramics to metal work to painting. Um, I think that they keep thinking that eventually they'll have more free time, but SpaceX keeps them pretty busy. Um, so I don't know if that'll be something they do when they retire or <laughs> if, you know, but right now there's not a lot of time for it in their lives. Got it. Thank you guys for answering that. Any questions from the audience? Love to, uh, if anybody has anything to say or comment, you can scroll through the chats. I'll send you guys a copy of it too after this okay. talk so you can see what people have had some nice, great, great feedback for you both during this, this fun event. And it was really great to see the, the legacy to have created and have exposed to the public with this museum show and now permanently in Muskegon. So fantastic stuff. And thank you guys for being here today and joining us. I'll be posting this on YouTube later for Infinity and Beyond for us to share for those who are going to be here and uh, to get the word out. And it's like, it's, again, I thank you for joining us and giving us a tour in a way for those of us who haven't had a chance to go see the exhibition. It's on until you said till February next year. So if you have a chance to go and see the exhibition at the museum, I highly recommend it and enjoy the town while you're there. And then give us your feedback. Let us know how, what you did when you were there and so we can tell others about it too. So. Thank you again, everybody, for joining us today. Welcome. I wish you a great weekend. And we'll see you next week for the next Habitat Zoom. Welcome to Unmute Yourself right. and say goodbye. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Kate. And we'll talk yeah. real soon. Be yep. well. Bye-bye. Okay. Yep. Bye-bye.